Welcome to the No Name Brand Podcast. My name is Sashka Hanarapal, actress, singer, dancer, turned brand marketing sales and advertising strategist who brands your soul. And each week I bring you an inspiring person or message to help you discover your undergod, turn up your leadership notches, challenge the status quo, because you're fast and furious with a powerful message to share with the world. Thank you for taking time out with me today. And without further ado, let's get our creative and wisdom juices below. Woohoo, folks, we're back. It's another week of the No Name Brand Podcast with moi, your host, Seshka where I invite inspiring and visionary guests from around the world to share their thought leadership on entrepreneurship. Yes, please. We like the mothership coming down. Their world and business philosophy. And at the same time, because I'm all about putting knowledge into action, learning something new that you can implement today to be the change that you want to see and be in the world. Now, today's guest once had a dream to write a best-selling mystery adventure series and run an asteroid mining company, but was told, dude, that's a fantasy. Did that stop our next guest? No way, Jose. As an avid Transformers fan, especially Megatron, our guest knows what it means to focus on a mission and the evolution of that mission. Now, back in the heyday of pre-Facebook La La Land, Our guest was a big fish in a small pond, having a right all good splash. But as things do, they evolve. And with that, our next guest went from big fish to small fish in the vast ocean. But wait, you see, success means something different than it did five years ago. Back then, you know, it was largely about dominating the marketplace. Being the go-to guy for answers on conversion topics, ensuring that as much of the traffic could be drawn his way. And he knew he was in the best position to help. But when your personal definition of success has changed, the price to be paid changes too. And that price for our next guest boiled down to the ever-precious four-letter word, time. In other words, who should get my time? I love this dude because time is an illusion anyway. But when we actually focus on that, who's going to get my time? And our guest's time is specialized on conversions as opposed to tracking leads, which he now knows is his biggest go-to and where his time is most focused. Where his focus started off mainly being on marketing and sales in 2014, and that is like five years ago, people, right? We're almost at the end of 2019. His focus now lies in the consideration for the future and how human life will be, what to do about the serious problems we face today, and how we can use technology in ethical ways to solve those problems. I love this because this is so important. This is what a brand does to influence generations. This is what I preach about. Coming back to Megatron and his focus on his mission. Mm -hmm. Our next guest understands the importance of focusing on the zone of genius to get you and your business catapulting forward, not only financially profitable, but also profitable for the forward thinking ideas that lie within your business that will keep you focused on reaching higher levels of success that serves not only you and your business, but for life and humanity in general. Megatron, yes please, transform from normal to out of this freaking world. My kind of guy, folks. So let's give our next guest a huge round of applause and welcome the one and only Jason Kanigan. Hello, Jason. Hi, Saska. So uh, I guess I'll drop my boxer's robe then and get into the <laughs> ring with you. And, <laughs> and it's the it rocket, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's great to have you with us today. We had a few hiccups, time zone differences right. last week. I'm so glad that we could actually manage to get this because I really want to get your message out to the world. So we're going to break this down into three different 
sections, elements, phases, whatever we're going to speak about entrepreneurship, going to philosophy. And of course, what I love to do is education. So our listeners can take what they need from this interview and implement it today. So starting off, where did you see that it was important in your own life and business that operations improves processes? And when did the penny drop that you felt, oh, this is my thing? Hmm. So I got an operations management diploma of technology in 1994 to 1996. It was the first wow. diploma that I finished. And well, I was like 23 years old and they wouldn't let me use it, right? Nobody wants to let a young guy run a factory. And so I was in sales and marketing for a few years and eventually quit that because I wanted to be a factory manager and I got it. I went out and got a plant manager job when I was 25 when people told me, again, oh, you have to pay your dues and you can't do it. Well, with the right positioning and the right conversations, you can go do that. So I found myself running a like a three shift, 24 seven recycling business. And a year later, I was 26 years old and I was managing 150 people at a garment factory with Whoa. six supervisors reporting to me. And I discovered I hated it because there was no, <laughs> there was no smart thinking there. It was a bunch of, I call it a little mafia village of tattletale people all complaining about each other. You know, Sashka took five minutes longer on lunch break than me. And I said, I don't care. <laughs> uh, that's not what I want my day to be about, you know? So I did a bunch of other things, but I always had that operations management process engineering skill set in my back pocket. But when I moved from Canada to the United States in 2009, I don't recommend moving countries unless you absolutely have to. It's a real pain. You have nothing. You have no bank account, no doctor, no credit history, nothing, and you have to start over. And I've been doing that, you know, it's 10 years now. And I just feel like I'm starting to get a feel for how to live properly, not just survive and, and try and move along. But in the meantime, I got involved with sales training. I was at my first role in the States was sales trainer, senior consultant for a sales training firm. Did a lot with software as a service businesses, value added resellers out there in the real world, not the internet marketing type because they didn't even exist yet in, yeah. in that era, right? They've only come out of high school and shown up in the last few years. But I always had this idea, gee, I should run an operations improvement business. It would be fun to go in and investigate other companies and help them know the score, what is mm -hmm. actually happening in their business, rather than the stories they're telling themselves, which may be true and may not, usually are not, let's be real, uh, and, <laughs> exactly. and find out like where the big problems are and help them fix them. Not by telling them like you need to do this or that, but by giving them different ways of thinking and mm -hmm. extracting knowledge out of their heads that they didn't even know they had. Uh, but for years, I thought, oh, like that's, that's such a time and labor intensive business. And it's like mind capital intensive. And maybe I don't want to do it. It's so much easier to just sit back and talk sales. Mm -hmm. Very easy for me to do that. I can just get paid to talk, right? But with operations improvement, I need to hire people and get them out there and, and actually think. <laughs> yeah. So I put, I put that off for years and years and years. But after getting out of a previous business in 2017, I decided, okay, it's time to do it. I'm going to do it now. And so I had a business that had been operating since 2016. And I just went into that full time, which is this cold star. I, I made it an operations improvement business for other companies. I so love that. Since then, um, that's what I've been doing. And that's when the penny dropped. Yeah. Speaking about your name, cold yeah. star tech for our listeners. It has a project going, which is a platform for those with experience to get together and talk about the unexpected challenges of scaling. What are those challenges? Okay, so that's my podcast. That's, so I do a YouTube live show with it, and then I strip the audio out and put that out on podcasts. And we're at like 80 episodes this week, so it's not a, I'm going to have a podcast <laughs> thing, right? Like I see all these people doing that, and they do two episodes, and then they get tired of it, right? You know, <laughs> No, I've been doing this for a year, and we have a lot of episodes. But I didn't want it to just be me. Right? I didn't want Jason jumping up and down going, hey, you know, as you grow your business, you're going to run into trouble. Because the big issue is, especially under two, four million dollars in revenue in there, people think that, oh, if I just get the next bag of money, or if I just do double the marketing and the sales effort that I did before, that'll be enough. And that'll help me grow to the next plateau, a revenue plateau. And it won't. You will break your business. Because the systems will not be in place and your thinking will not be in place to help carry you up there. Okay, and hang on, hang on, Jason. Yeah. yeah. Repeat that, please. 
please. Okay. Because I need my listeners to yeah. hear this. When you build a brand, it's long term. It's not mm-hmm. feast and famine. Please repeat right. that. So in order to grow and go from the one revenue plateau, let's say under a million dollars up to five million, and then from five million to ten or twenty million or something, you cannot do just more of the same. Yes. Double the same. It will not work. You need different thinking about yourself as the business owner and how you're going to delegate and how systems work, just lead generation. It becomes something different. And we could dig into this for a long answer. And maybe, maybe we will. Please maybe we will. Go ahead. Enough. Go maybe ahead. Maybe not right now. Do because it. Because I, I want to give it out in little chunks so that people don't get overwhelmed. But mm. That's the big thing about Facebook that I've noticed. There's a lot of business people on Facebook. They're used to monthly income of maybe $2,000 a month or less. They can't invest in anything. And they think, oh, everyone else is like this. And that's the only way it can be. No, no. But you have to get results and then change your thinking and your systems to move up to the next level. That's why people just struggle. I've watched some struggle. Been online since 2011, selling stuff since 2012. And there are some people who are in exactly the same spot as I first saw them. And that's, that's entirely to do with what's going on between their ears, right? So eventually a business owner gets the idea that traffic and conversion are important. They figure, okay, I need, I need to know how many leads I bring in to get a sale. And that's like a light bulb moment for a lot of people. Once they figure out, oh, if I get 50 leads from this particular traffic source, Facebook ads or whatever, uh, then I'll get a sale. Yeah. And then they can start doing math. And only a fraction of business owners actually get that far, mm-hmm. right? Most are still floating around going, I don't know how much money I'm going to make this month. They don't have a baseline. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of thinking that goes into this. And a lot of people probably shouldn't be in business who are trying to be in business. And they just get overwhelmed with it and go, I don't want to deal with that. But a few get focused, figure that out, and they grow to a certain level. And they think they're doing great. And they are. But they can't just throw more money at the traffic side of the problem or try and increase traffic and conversion to make more money. You, you have to do something else because what will actually happen is your fulfillment system, how you deliver that product or service will break. Mm. And all those orders that you brought in, I've heard story after story, Sashka, about business owners bringing in a consultant who does a really great job of selling and then they're like oversold, like they sold a hundred of these things and the, and the business owner was expecting 10 and they really, they freak out and they refund the money and they go, uh-uh, I can't deliver all this. We're going to fail. I've seen that so many times over the yeah. years. That is the kind of thing that I'm talking about when I say your fulfillment system will break. Mm-hmm. It would just not be strong enough. So it's not just online businesses. I've often seen that as well happen to you know, programs like the Lion's Den or Dragon, Mm -hmm. whatever, you know, where you have the four investors Mm -hmm. sitting and then you pitch your idea. I've often seen that businesses the same, even though they have an investor, they don't have the infrastructure and there'll be so much demand and they cannot supply and the business goes under and then they just think, oh, I'm a failure. And it's just like, no, you just weren't prepared for that. Right. Yeah, exactly. So the Cold Star Project is my show some of the episodes are me talking about a particular thing on my soapbox about scaling up and the challenges you're going to run into, like I just talked about. And that was a very surface skim level. Usually I talk about a particular symptom or a particular problem, but I also have the other half or two thirds or whatever of episodes are guests that I bring on and they must have gotten to half a million dollars in revenue. If they haven't mm-hmm. gotten there. They don't have anything and they don't deserve to be on the show because they're not going to have any lessons. But typically, they're in that one, two, five, six million dollar range. I did have a guy who was on who had thirteen and a half million dollars in annual revenue. And these are great conversations because mm-hmm. these folks have been punched in the face, knocked around, experienced all these problems that I've been talking about, and come out the other side with solutions. Like Jonathan Kikebush, who runs SEO Butler, he was on to talk about. Uh, I think it was like a thirty thousand dollar IT infrastructure investment because he had all these. You know how to, our APIs plug into everything, right? So, oh, we've got all these integrations. Well, yeah, what that means is you've duct taped a bunch of pipes and pumps and stuff like that together. Oh, and when you scale, guess what? The sales and marketing are going to break this thing, right? And you know you're delivering a shoddy second-rate service. And that's where they got to. And they had to gulp because that was a lot of money for them, right? Mm-hmm. It's probably a lot of money for anybody. And the project is like, well, we're going to start and we have expectations as to build an integrated solution, right? A cast iron version of this thing instead of duct tape version. And 
we don't really know when this project's going to end or exactly how much it's going to cost, but we have to commit. And they came out the other side with a really great service now supported by that system for delivery. So that's the kind of story that you'll hear on my show where folks go through and it's not just about tech. Sometimes it's sales, sometimes it's marketing. There's a lot of tech in it and infrastructure stuff. But, and I do a little bit of space. That's where the name came from. Cold Star is a real thing. It's a, it's a star that didn't quite work. And the idea is to extract as much energy out of it as you can. And I want to work in space. So that's why I picked it. So the space love people that. love it. They get it right away. And for some reason, the investment bankers and finance people get it right away. And I don't know why, but it's their like awesome name. And okay, good. <laughs> and then the rest of the world goes, what does that mean? You know, and I had a business before this called Sales on Fire. And so I like the contrast between mm. fire, hot and, and cold. cold, cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's the deal there. So folks can tune into the Cold Star Project anywhere on YouTube or iTunes or Spotify or any of those other audio. I do recommend you go to YouTube and see the YouTube version if you can. Mm. Um, and that's linked to from my site, coldstartech.com or coldstarproject.com where I have a few key episodes up there, but then you can go onto the about page and go to the YouTube version. I because I think that. the video version is a little more fun. Yeah. And just seeing people as well, you know, because a lot of people like mm -hmm. to be visual as well. So this is what I've often seen when businesses, even if you're starting up, it doesn't really matter whether you're starting up or wherever you, s and I don't like using the word scaling because it just sounds mm -hmm. sleazy. But anyway, <laughs> you know, like a scale or something. Whatever yeah. phase you're in, you need to prepare for wherever you're going especially for creative visionaries, because they feel that, you know, if I prepare for something, I'm held by boundaries and then I'm boxed in and I can't be that expansive. But we need boundaries and so we know how to push the envelope or where we want to push the envelope to. Now, what we hear a lot of is about sales and sales, you're worth it and the mindset around sales, which is all, it's all good. It's all good. Only... There's never anything really presented or I have found personally, which is why I was excited that you were coming on the show, is about a process for sales when you're building within your business. Because yeah. not many people know that they, you're not going to be selling forever. Or the goal is you don't want to be selling mm -hmm. forever. So you want people to actually go, this is how I sell and put it into a process so other people yeah. can sell for you. Sure. And that's something that I have done as a service and something that I, I have people to people, especially that I refer people to who I talk to need that because mm. they're very good at it. And they deal with stuff like the CRM that I don't. That's customer relationship management tool yep. for those who don't recognize that term where you keep all the records of your prospects and clients and that kind of thing. I'm not really a tech guy. I can deal with it, but I don't particularly love it. And there are people who do love it. <laughs> so, but as far as the process goes, yeah, I don't make fun of people or blame people for not knowing that there's other ways of selling than the traditional features and benefits, overcoming objections with rebuttals, wrestle in the mud with the pig kind of <laughs> selling because it didn't even occur to me. And I was in sales positions and good at it. You understand for 10 years, mm. 10 years before it occurred to me, light bulb. Oh, hey, I don't know why I get some orders and I don't get others. Mm. Why is that? I couldn't answer the question. You know, I could get any sales job that I wanted. I was pretty good as a tech guy because I worked in um, IT and I worked in power generation. And so I could match up generators and gearboxes and that kind of thing, right? And all things. But, you know, <laughs> it, it just, and, and I'd be in a room with like, let's have your listeners hear this. I was in rooms with like eight other salespeople working for multi-million dollar companies and literally every person, every salesperson gave a different experience to that prospect calling in. So if they called Jason or they called Sashka across the cubicle hallway, it was a different experience. There was no consistent process. There was no sales training. It was just, here's the manual. Here's your computer. Here's your phone. Here's your desk. Bye-bye. Good luck. You know, get at them. And that always struck me as odd. So it took me 10 years to ask, is there another style of selling? And yes, there is. And there are three main ones, which I've talked about. And anybody who wants a little note about that or a Quora answer that I can link to, they can get a hold of me on Facebook or something or send me an email, awesome. uh, jason at coldstartech.com, and I will happily send them there. And, uh, and that'll give you an idea that there are different styles of selling. And so I learned the consultative style, and I've moved to the challenger style over time after resisting it for a long time. So what, what, uh, cause it seemed pushy, right? Uh, mm. But there's a way around it where you don't have to be pushy and it's like, 
helping them get the idea themselves and then they're excited about it. But for a business owner to, to have run on founder fuel, as we call it, for some time, that will take you quite far, right? Because you're excited about it and then you're like, well, hey, I sell at 90% or whatever of the prospects I meet, right? Which is insane. Like, and no one is going to do that other than you. No one, right? But you need to become a CEO, which means your mind needs to be on strategy and strategic partnerships and joint ventures and that. And, and like glomming on to other organizations that allow you access to their complementary customer list of buyers, right? Mm -hmm. That's much better use of your time rather than trying to plink off customers one at a time. Go get a list of 20,000 people who have bought something that's complementary to your service or product, creatives especially, and have the owner of that business send them an email saying, hey, I really endorse this. I love it. Why don't you have a look at it? And You've got a cost of customer acquisition, whether you acknowledge it or not. Your time is, we talk about this all the time, the circle of people that I'm involved in. Our time is like $1,000 an hour, and we have to act like it. And so is yours. Even if you're a small business owner who isn't selling very much, your time is that valuable, Mm -hmm. and you have to start believing it. And what that means is your cost of customer acquisition is several thousand dollars typically because you're knocking around, especially if you're on Facebook or LinkedIn, trying to connect with people have conversations. And this takes a few hours, right, to get to a yes. And that's if you're good at getting to yes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What if you're not, right? It might take you three conversations or four or eight conversations, and it takes you two hours. That's like 16 hours, let's say, right, at $1,000 an hour. Wow. And if you don't acknowledge that in some way and price your, your offer accordingly, no wonder you're going in the hole and your business is suffering every month, right? So, What that means is you have that giant cost of customer acquisition if you're doing it. If you actually pull that off and give it to, um, like my friend Jeremy Pope, who runs a business called The Closing Engine, which I helped found and then I've moved on uh, from it, he runs sales teams on behalf of other companies. Mm -hmm. They sell high ticket offers. I think the minimum six or eight thousand dollars right now, and, and it goes up from there for these offers. And what that does is it frees up that business owner and the cost of customer acquisition is probably reduced because it's going to a professional salesperson. You know, they match it up. And that's, that's a thing that we were big on when I was there with the personality type. Like they don't do the hardcore grab them in a headlock kind of way of making them sell. Right. (laughs) And so there, yeah, there's a lot of talking with that business owner when they sign up about, okay, how do you want our people to approach this? And so that's the same thing that I would have one of my, my friends that I would, pass along or refer this kind of a project to do is they would go in and they would sit down with that business owner and say, okay, I understand that you don't know anything about process mapping or something. It doesn't matter, right? Just tell me, just Mm -hmm. tell me who's your ideal customer. How do you normally approach them? What sort of things do you normally say? And they'll extract all that information, right? Write it down and they'll set up the process steps. The Mm -hmm. business owner doesn't have to freak out about that stuff. They'll just talk to this person And that person will extract it out, write it down and give them, here's your process map. These are the steps. This is the kind of thing people will say. And actually the closing engine will ask for a couple of sales call recordings from that Mm -hmm. business owner so they can actually hear it. And when you're a sales professional, you know, you can pull that stuff out of the call, right? What the process is, how it's working, and then give that to a uh, third party closer who will act like the business owner Mm -hmm. following that. And it's not a script, but it is a series of steps, right? And there are pain points that that are common that they can use and know to find out about. And so the experience will be a lot like that business owner actually doing it. But again, it will probably be cheaper. Yeah, they won't close at the 90% crazy founder fuel rate. But if they close at 30, 40% and the cost per lead and cost of customer acquisition drops because the $1,000 an hour guy is not on it anymore, mm-hmm. right? It makes a lot of sense with the math. Yeah. And, and it frees up that business owner to really be a business owner and be creative and look into the future and go, okay, how do I need to change my product or service to survive, adapt, and, and continue? Uh, who else can I partner with? and all kinds of other decisions that they normally don't have time to do because they're pressured by the immediate thing of, wow, I'm the source of revenue for my company. Mm -hmm. If you're the sole source of revenue for your company, you should be terrified. (laughs) You should be terrified and do something about it. 
Well, yeah. that's the thing, doing something about it. I mean, there's so mm -hmm. many entrepreneurs that are in a state of feast and famine. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one month it's like, oh my God, I've had like however much they're making. And then it goes yeah. for a very long time, there's a drought and you don't know how mm -hmm. to get where yeah. or what. Now, the clients that you've spoke with, the clients, the people that you've had on your show, I forgot about his name now, but mm -hmm. I remember you mentioned him that, Anybody. you know, with $13 million, but right. they started at that point. What was it? Was it just their mindset that <clears throat> changed that they went from maybe 10,000 a month where they just did yeah. that quantum leap where they got to a million? What changed and how do things change over there for them? Right. And that particular example is Ryan Kohler, cool guy with a great app about helping connect job seekers and job offerers. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's a great talent acquisition thing. And what he did was he looked into how are people actually using this thing? Mm. Not how I wish they would use it, which is how most product creators and software as a service founders believe, right? And feel and act, but how are they actually using it? And where are the breakpoints? And so what he found was these HR managers will never sit there and take time to enter in a candidate's information into our system. Mm. They won't do it. Right. And so that means that the usage rate, <laughs> it's plummets, right? What if I automate that? And also the candidates who are on indeed.com or monster or something like that. What if they don't have to leave that site because mm -hmm. they hate leaving it? Exactly. Right? And so he integrates it all so that the, the applicant doesn't have to lead or leave the site and the HR manager doesn't have to enter the information. And it just flows in and suddenly, bling, an email comes up. Hey, you've got a candidate to review. And now the usage rate skyrockets, mm -hmm. right? And there's a balance between when the economy is doing good and when it's not performing poorly. And that changes, that shifts the balance of power with mm -hmm. the applicants versus the HR managers, right? Or the employers. Yeah. And so he has gotten ways to predict and react to that and enhance that user level so and anyone wanting more can go listen to that episode just search it for ryan kohler awesome. and you'll find out so again very different thinking right it's not wow i want to change the world which is what most software as a service founders do rush out there in isolation because they had a brainwave go create a product right and then find like nobody wants it or ask them how do i sell this right mm. And now they're stuck. And you see this, like I'm in a, a bunch of SaaS groups and the majority are making under $2,000 a month monthly recurring revenue and suffering. And the, the group owners know it because I've had them on my show and talked to them about it and that. And, and, you know, this is why, because they didn't go out and create something where they found out, okay, how are people actually going to use it? And you can see in Ryan's example, it was a bit reactive. Right. He did go create the thing and then go, okay, how are people? But he asked a deeper question. He threw out his limiting yeah. beliefs or his biases about what I believe about how people are going to use this. It's like, and I've been a copywriter for 25 years, by the way, interviewed on Dan Kennedy's um, small business podcast show for the no BS thing for Glazer Kennedy. And every time I have gone into a situation to write copy, where I thought, oh, I know what the market wants. I know what the customer wants. I was dead wrong. <laughs> I'm just, I just don't think like they do and I never will. And so I've learned to just chuck that out mm -hmm. and go ask, exactly. go ask. What, what does the target market actually want? And I think if people did that, they would do better. I mean, 2011, I joined a, a very popular forum at the time and uh, there was an offline marketing section and I went in there and I spent like three months just answering questions in the evening and participating with this group of people. Mm -hmm. And I found out what they wanted, exactly. right? First of all, yeah. they told me, because I could have offered copywriting, operations improvement, sales training, web design, right? I had all these skills. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people like later on were like, how can you be this one thing and then this other thing? And that because I had the skills before I got there. Thank you yeah. very much. So by spending that time just interacting with them, I found out that consultative sales training was a gap there that needed to be filled. And so I joined in like November and then in January when I opened this offer up, it went crazy. Yeah. And I delivered it by a live call, which was stupid. I should, eventually I recorded the thing and it got it blew up over the years into three membership sites. And now it's a thing that I don't even sell privately. I just give it to high-end clients and I'm like, here, this, you just get this. 
But at the time, like that was the reaction. I went in and found out what they wanted. And most people are so desperate for cash that they can't do that. I was making money doing copywriting gigs off of Elance at the time. Remember, I'd moved to the US and this was a year or so after I'd been given my work authorization, right? Something that most people don't even think of. You're not allowed to work just because you went to another country. In the EU, it's a little different, I understand. Mm. But Canada and the US are not buddies. And that, mm. that is something that the world needs to know. They are not friends. <laughs> so, <laughs> but learning what people want, showing up, getting in front of them. And I got to a point after that three months where people were telling me, they would message me or just write it in as a comment, like, I don't care what you're talking about. I'm going to look at your post. Mm. Right? Yeah. It doesn't matter what the subject is. I know I'm going to learn something. And I've had people on that forum tell me uh, or tell other people, hey, go find Jason's posts and just read them in reverse chronological order. Yeah. Read them all. Just go over there. It's yeah. something I did a live where, uh, I don't know, the heading... I'll, I'll put a link to it, uh, you know, how you can scale your business. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that there's two things I said, one, you need to research and two, mm-hmm. you need to evaluate one mm-hmm. for the research corporates, hire companies for focus groups. Mm-hmm. You have the resources that you can go and offer free sessions or whatever to gain information and research mm-hmm. so that you can find out what is the need and fill it. Mm-hmm. Fill Mm -hmm. the need because that's where the business. So you might have whatever you're doing, but find, you know, adapt it to whatever the need is at the moment. Like you were saying right in the beginning, what is it at the moment that you need to fill the next level? You're going to need something else to fill over Mm -hmm. there. And then going from this, you need to move. It's not trends. You're moving with the times and where Mm -hmm. you at the moment, you cannot stay stagnant in that respect, you know, as a small business owner or, you know, small business owners and creative visionaries in general that are, and even though you're a small business owner, it doesn't mean you're small. You could still be a small business owner and still be earning, you know, a lot of money mm-hmm. and be successful. And as a creative visionary, uh, what is a step for our listeners that can and must be implemented today to create a tangible result in scaling your business for the short and long term that'll bring them profits and a humanitarian result? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a lot in that question. There was um, a lot. There let's let's lot. unpack it. Okay. So first of all, the word scaling, right? You've said yes. you don't like don't it. Like and that I'm like, scaling. yeah, I'm interested in that you don't like it. And it means different things to different people. An HR expert will be like, oh, scaling's about right hiring practices and retention mm-hmm. and making them feel good and that kind of thing. And that's true. Scaling to me is about processes and systems. And that's true. Scaling for other people, particularly Facebook business-based people, is about traffic and conversion, which Mm -hmm. I have said will only take you so far, and that's as far as they get. Now, I have had clients who ran a business by themselves with an assistant, like a tech assistant or something, who are making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month. There's, Mm -hmm. which is you're hitting my minimum now, right? You're getting to a half million dollars a year, right? Yeah. And they get bids on stuff for a hundred thousand dollars from agencies. Like, you want this? Okay, this is what it costs. Just to give you an idea here, right? That a single person can do. They're in like stock trading usually. That seems to be a a financial type sector. And anybody, again, who wants this, just email me at jason at coldstartech.com and I will send it to you. I did a live. It's on my YouTube channel, December of last year, and I may have uploaded it a little later. It was all about planning for the following year. But again, you could apply this at any time, right? So basically, if you don't have a roadmap and you don't have a destination, how the heck are you going to know where you're going? Everybody says they know that, but then you ask them, okay, how much money have you made this month? How much do you expect to make next month or by the end of the year? And they're like, I don't know. I I make as much as I can. And that's, I'm going to be flat out and say that's stupid. Okay. (laughs) That is no plan at all. And without a target, whether you're a scientific person, a rational person, or a law of attraction person, which I also think is rational, but anyway, without something to tell your mind, this is what I'm shooting for $20,000 a month, $2,000 a month, whatever it is, you're never going to get there and it won't be consistent. So you need to get at the level of basic business owner that we're probably talking to here. You need to understand your business math Mm -hmm. and A lot of people run away from math, right? I was terrible at math in high school, grade school, high school. I had to go take a course to get into the college that I wanted to get into where I had to get a B or higher. And I finally got a teacher uh, who unfortunately passed away not long after, just a few years after. But uh, his name was Joel Ribbick. And uh, 
man, he just changed my mindset about it totally. It was like, look, math is systematic. Learn the system, repeat, practice it, and you will do well on the tests. And nobody had ever told me that before. Mm -hmm. It sounds so simple, right? So the same thing can be applied and you don't have to be afraid. All we're going to do is addition and subtraction, basically, and maybe a little multiplication, division. That's it, mm -hmm. right? There's no fractals and formulas and stuff, really. It's simple addition, right? And it's like, you need to develop a baseline mm -hmm. of how many leads do I need to bring into the system to get a sale, yeah. right? That's it. And then what's a sale worth? Mm -hmm. And so what this will show you is, okay, I want to make a thousand dollars a month my products fifty dollars let's say or something like that okay it's easy to figure out through division how many sales do i need to make right mm -hmm. 20 you know and then you can go okay well in a month what does that mean that means i need to make a sale every working day mm -hmm. right that tells you the pace that you're running at right what speedometer reading have i got on my business here and you might go wow i just realized there's no way i can do that right? Like I just can't. Even before we go out to the traffic side, that's just the conversion side. How many sales do I need? Just that understanding alone might make you go, wow, I've got to raise my prices or make an offer that is valued at $500, let's say. So I need to only make two. And now I can, that's not a lot of money, by the way, $500 yeah. sales are easy. Money tolerance is a big thing I talk about, which is how much is a lot of money to you, mm. that answer. And you should be checking on yourself at least once a week. I check every day. Mm. What, how much is a lot of money to me? And I do this to test sales people when I'm brought in to help a salesperson. I don't tell them what I'm doing, but I find out how much is a lot of money. And they're like, $100,000. And I'm like, yeah, that's baloney. We'll back it down. 50000 What if you had to get it today? 20000 10000 5000 And I'll tell you, most of the time, it's between two and $5,000 is the mm. real money tolerance. So what if you're trying to sell an $8,000 program? Yeah. And you've got a money tolerance of $3,000. You're going to find ways to screw up that sale. Yeah. Right? And this is a unconscious limiting belief active position that everybody's in. Everybody's got limiting beliefs. I've got a money tolerance everybody's like where $100,000 is, is an interesting, scary investment, right? Like mm -hmm. I, I'm like, eh, right now. And I realize that I know where the goalposts are. And I know that if I'm to improve in my business, I need to move that out. Right? Mm. And there's a lower limit as well where I'm like, I'm not going to sell that. That's stupid. That's mm. a waste of my time. It's probably cheap and garbage and I don't want to be associated with it. Right. Yeah. So knowing where those goalposts are and moving them is really important. So I wanted to cover that because it does affect that sale price. Mm. And notice how this is being done before you're picking an offer. Exactly. Right? Yeah. I want people to start out at that, what is a lot of money? Okay, get the speedometer idea. How many sales do I actually believe I can make in a month, right? And then back out to your traffic source. And each traffic source needs its own formula like this because Twitter is different from YouTube, is different from Facebook, is different from who knows, somebody's joint venture list is different from, what are those things called where you pay to be on somebody's list or access somebody's uh, list? Affiliate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's another term for it as well, but I can't remember it right now. I don't deal with that very often. Uh, mm. Solo ads. There we go. And I don't even know if those are popular anymore because I'm not a traffic <laughs> guy. <laughs> I can tell you how many people you need coming into your system and what they should look like. But as far as where you get them, that ain't me. Right? Yeah. And there's tons and tons of traffic people out there who will sell you the dream. Don't you worry. Right? <laughs> but to develop a baseline and people will go, well, Jason, we're spitballing here. We're just throwing out numbers. How do I know that this is real? Right? And I'm like, yes, correct. You are estimating to begin with. Mm -hmm. Estimate conservatively and then collect data and compare plan versus actual performance at the end of the month. Right? Mm -hmm. And see where you're at. I have a training that will show you okay, is the problem on the traffic quality side or is it on the conversion side? Yeah. Right? So, and identifying that is really important, right? Because like when it doesn't work, people will change everything all at once. They'll switch from a video sales letter to a written sales letter. They'll change the colors. They'll change the layout. They might even change the offer and the price mm -hmm. and they'll change the traffic source. And all you've done is muddle the waters. Yeah. How do you know, right? Change one thing at a time. So, Let's say for those 20 sales, I'm conservatively estimating I need 100 people coming into the system to get one of those sales, right? So now 20 times 100, right? We're in a lot of traffic. And I'll tell you, I've been doing strategy calls, funnel strategy calls like this for like seven years. And the number one problem that we discover 
when I'm talking over it with a business owner like this, is they had nowhere near enough traffic coming in or ever going to come in to justify or have a chance of creating that revenue outcome on the other side that they probably were vaguely imagining and not very specific about, right? Yeah. Like, oh, it would be nice if, right? And they're beaten before they begin. And that's really sad. Like I'm talking 10% levels of traffic here of what they actually required when we do this exercise. And when they realize that, boy, is that a, a change? Because then they realize that speedometer needs to increase and they need to up their offer in value, right? Yeah. Or they really need to go crazy on getting traffic and yeah. good traffic. And, and that, that gives them focus. So they come out of these conversations like confident and relaxed and feeling supported in that and knowing that they have a baseline now. And then at the end of the month, you go, okay, because that's something you can control. Yeah. Is the yeah. number of people who come into your funnel. I can't really control the conversion side that much. I put up something and see how it, it does, whether mm -hmm. it's a sales call or a video sales letter with a buy button at the end or something. But I can control how many people get dumped into my funnel. Yeah. Even if I cold call them, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I can still do something. So once you understand that, then at the end of the month, you can say, okay, I put my 2,000 people in. I was hoping for... 20 sales, and I needed a number of qualified leads, which have need, budget, and personality fit in the middle mm -hmm. out of those. How many did I actually get? I needed 200 to get a one in 10 sales conversion, let's say, right? Out of those qualified leads I'm talking here, not out of the unqualified yeah. leads that we're dumping into the funnel. So this is where the math, it's really simple. It's just three numbers, right, on paper, but talking about it makes it sound a little mathy and People yeah, we got well, about it, but it's not complicated at all. So summarizing that, um, mm -hmm. I, mean, I usually what we need to look at is the so just to put this into terms for creative visionary. So you need to see if you, I use the system ten for one. So if you want mm -hmm. one client, you need to get ten people in. Four will be interested. Mm -hmm. So if you want two hundred people, you need to get two thousand people in. Right. Where you're going to then go? Oh, okay, that's where I'm going to get it in and bring yeah. that into perspective. Oh, my darling, I am here to interrupt this interview just really, really quickly to inform you that I have something for you if you are new to business and you need a business plan. I have a breakthrough business plan just for you. All you need to do is go clickety-click all the way to learn.brandsashka.com and you will find it. Woohoo! And now let us get back to the interview. Au revoir! We're coming near the end, and yeah. um, I ask all my guests two questions. One of them being to fill in three of my five highest values, what they mean to you. So if you fill in the blanks, dun -dun -dun. Mm. passion for you is? Changing the world changing the world, getting user adoption of certain things. Like I want to make space boring. <laughs> and by, by doing that, we will have so much activity, right? It will be as boring as taking the bus or driving a car or something like that, right? Love it's just, it. oh, we just do it. Cool. Yeah, a long-term passion goal of mine. <laughs> yeah. Bring it in, asteroid that blood. Uh, mm -hmm. Wisdom for you is? I am not very wise for myself. Uh, I'm not. I'm smart. I'm like a, a wizard, you know. But <laughs> I'll go and try and build my tower in a field that happens to belong to a bunch of villagers, and they'll get upset and show up with torches and pitchforks trying to get me out of there <laughs> occasionally. <laughs> I try not to be evil, you know. Yeah, so wisdom. But I had a buddy of mine who knows me very well say, oh, of course, your wisdom is for others. Mm. So that's what that's what it means because he loves my posts and I share I write long posts that usually that share a lot of information and they're pretty thick and you know they're not for everyone right if, if you don't want to learn anything then don't mm. follow me you know? <laughs> like, go and go and grab some candy from somebody else and it'll taste better probably but it won't help you in the long term so yeah. wisdom for me means um, helping other people love that creativity for you is hmm state of mind Mm. state of mind i need to be calm and secure and then i can go access it if i'm panicking then <laughs> I'm not, then i'm not in the right state of mind to access that i love so that creativity is something that i can use every day and what is one word that is your word for this month at the moment hmm 
I guess fantastic. Like this is really a month of really, uh, I've shed off a lot of dead weight in my life very recently and moved on on a lot of things and that. And it's like bolts firing, you know, disconnecting me from those things. And I'm able to really plan and go execute on the future that I want. And that hasn't been possible for a while. I've really been locked into something for a while. And now I can literally pick whatever I want. I can go be whatever I want right now. And that's, that's pretty neat. That's yeah. pretty fantastic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, yeah. thank you so much for being with us here today. And the listeners can also find out a lot about you on coldstartech.com, mm -hmm. T-E-C-H.com. As Jason mentioned, he's got a lot of information. Go and check out on his YouTube channel, Spotify, any information that you're wanting to find out, processes, operations. The dude knows his stuff, people. Yay. So get to know him. In the show notes, you'll find the links as well to his favorite book, his favorite quote, where he's on social media, mm. and also reading his blog. He's got really cool um, articles that you can read as well. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thanks, Ashka. Thank you. <laughs> All right. And to my listeners, I shall hear you again next week. And remember to be fast and furious and be the change that you want to see in the world. Love you lots and see you again next week. Bye-bye. Dang, that was just super califragilisticexpialidocious. I enjoyed having you on board and please do me and you a favor. Head on over to iTunes, SoundCloud or Stitcher. Click subscribe and a super bonus. Leave your review and you stand a chance of being announced and advertised on the show. I'm always striving to ensure that your brand is uplifted and empowered. Remember, done is better than perfect. So be sure to subscribe, leave a review, and send in your feedback too. You're the absolute best. Keep rocking.